first reading is taken from Luke 2, and I'm reading verses 22 to 40, and it's on page 1028, 1028 in the Church Bibles. When the time of their purification, according to the law of Moses, had been completed, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord, and to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon, who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. When the parents brought to the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all people, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, This child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against, so that that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your own soul too. There was also a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher, She was very old. She had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage and then was a widow until she was 84. She never left the temple, but worshipped night and day, fasting and praying. Coming up to them at that very moment, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. When Joseph and Mary had done everything required by the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee to their own town of Nazareth, And the child grew and became strong. He was filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. I'm reading Psalm 24, to be found on page 555 in the Church Bible. Psalm 24. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. For he founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. Who may ascend the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to an idol or swear by what is false. He will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from God his Saviour. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek his face, O God of Jacob. Lift up your heads, O you gates. Be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O you gates. Lift them up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord Almighty. He is the King of glory. Amen.
came, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. Can you just drop it down a bit? Thanks. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. The world and all who live in it. Psalm 24, I think, is amazing. That's going to be kind of the main crux of my um, talk today, my sermon. It kind of really starts off well. And, I'm, and most people are familiar with this. And um, I encourage you to go back and look at Psalm 24. It talks quite a lot about God and who he is, what, what he's like. He is a God who's majestic. He is a God who has strength and power. He is mighty. And we are called to lift up our heads, or at least the gates are. And we're to lift them up to he who is the king of glory. There's a sense of sort of regalness and splendor of this God, our God. And the earth is his and everything in it. Look how powerful he is. He he formed it on the seas and established it upon the water. So he's a creator, an almighty, powerful God. I just wonder if you've had that kind of um, experience, that wow moment um, of our God, of the Lord God Almighty. That kind of stops you in your tracks. I had one kind of experience, and it didn't have to be in a church necessarily, but a sense of kind of majesty and sort of wowness, I suppose. If I, I stumbled onto uh, the Westminster Cathedral a couple of years ago, and they were celebrating the Holy Communion, the Eucharist, and the priests were all sort of decked out in all their regalia. There was incense sort of wafting whif- around, and there was a real sense of majesty, almost like you could imagine the Lord coming into his temple. But often we have experiences of the Lord God and his greatness, his majesty, this big, big God of ours, in sort of the things around us when we look at creation. And lots of people say, you know, they look at the stars, they look at what the hands um, of God has done. And we did that in sort of messy church not that long ago. We were looking at specific things. Some of them were rocks, but there were other things. Look how mighty this God of ours is. And that's sort of captured in that children's sort of worship song, Our God is a Big, Big God. And we tend to, oh, you know, it's only a children's worship song. But that's amazing. You know, I don't want a small God, and I'm sure you guys don't want them either. We want a God who is awesome and powerful and mighty, this creator God of ours. Our God is a Big, Big God. Now, verse 3 in Psalms talk about, so who may approach this Lord when he is like this, this splendor, this regal, powerful, mighty God? Who can ascend his holy hill? Or as it were, who can step up to the Lord God Almighty? Who can stand before him? And then it gives us this list. It says, the pure in heart. Pure in heart is about our motives and our attitudes. You know, do we have a degree of, um, do we manipulate and deceive? Do we have our own agendas? Because if we do, according to this psalm, we can't approach this amazing, mighty, holy God. It said if we have clean hands, we can step up this holy hill. Clean hands is about those who are guiltless or have no sin. It goes on, those who do not have any idols, anything that replaces God in our life. It talks about those who don't um, swear by what is false, so who do not lie. Well, when, when we read that, I feel like that's not, I can't approach that holy hill. There's a few of those I need to work on, in fact, quite a lot. <laughs> We're scuppered, and that's like us in this room too. We don't always have clean heart, pure hearts and clean hands. So does that mean we 
We can't approach God. There's a gap between us. Is that why we're alone? Now, how can a sinful people approach a holy, mighty, and an all-powerful God who hates sin? And we know we've, you've heard a lot of sermons before, and we know that we can't unless this mighty, awesome, holy God steps down into our reality. He just doesn't leave us floundering there, that gap between God up there, holy, perfect, powerful, and we down here who get it wrong and full of sin. He doesn't leave us in that place. He steps down into our reality. And John 1, verse 14, which I've kind of spoke on a bit before, and it's a really great phrase. It says, The Word became flesh and lived or tabernacled among us. And tabernacled just means he pitched his tent. And that's great. If you've been to New Wine, you know that God, the Lord God Almighty, pitches his tent with us. And so we're not floundering. We're not kind of a cast adrift. The Lord God comes and meets us. The word becomes flesh. And it lives. And he lives amongst us. Going back to verse 7 of that Psalm 24. Speaks of God king of glory coming into his temple and you know what he did the Lord God Almighty the king of kings he did show up and he stepped down into our reality not necessarily as the as King David in the Old Testament perhaps describes him but he comes as a baby the king of glory stepping down into our reality actually carried into his uh, temple, presumably in his mother's arms. And who was there to meet him when the king of glory did enter his temple? Who was there waiting for him? And so in Luke we see Simeon and Anna, or they might version it, it's interesting, she said she was 84. He didn't tell him his age, did it? Um, but Simeon and Anna were there. They were waiting for the king of glory. The Lord God had blessed them, had spoken to them. And they were charged to wait, to wait for the king of glory. Now, when I read that, I was thinking, well, where was everyone else? They were waiting. They witnessed the Lord God Almighty enter his kingdom, his temple. Who else noted, noticed that he was there? Because that temple would have been extremely busy. There would have been a lot of things happening. There would have been lots of animal sacrifices. I'm sure there are a number of babies there who are also being dedicated. Where was everyone else? Did anyone else witness the Lord Jesus enter his temple? What about the priests who performed this religious dedication service? They might have put their hand over the baby Jesus. Did he know that the king of glory was in front of him? That the king of kings? I mean, we don't know the answer to that. But Simeon and Anna were there. And it kind, it kind of begs the question, is it possible to miss the Lord's coming? So when Jesus entered his temple... How many people missed him? How many people missed the fact that he turned up? You know, would we miss Jesus if he walked into Christ Church? You know, would we walk past him? Would we kind of ignore him? Would we say hello? Would we miss him? The priests might have been going for the motions. They'd have had a lot of work to do. And they might have been almost like a little conveyor belt of dedications, I don't know. Or certainly dedica um, a conveyor belt of perhaps sacrifices. W 
would they have been going through the motions? Do we go through the motions sometimes? Well, not according to verse 5 of Psalm 24. Not if we seek his face. And it's interesting, there's been an awful lot about that phrase today. In, in, the worship is full of it. And people are like Ruth and Nice, you know, it was great when that happens because you think, yep, that's a bit of vindication there. We are called to seek his face. That's been a real big message in the service today and actually it was last week now I wrote this sermon last Saturday probably the same time that Lee um, was preparing for his so God was obviously coordinating that may be quite a big message actually for Christ Church and I'll leave that out I'm going to talk a bit more about it but the importance of us seeking Jesus' face I feel that Simeon and Anna were in that temple looking for the king of king, kings a long time. I think they were probably actively or actively seeking him. They would have, of course, had moments of doubt. Did God really say I would be alive when he turned up? I don't know how long they waited, but he could have told them when they were young. And Anna was at least 84. Simeon could have been around the same age. A long time. What about if they had a, a, a bad moment and they went for the motions and they, they think, oh, did I miss Jesus coming in? That could have been eating away at them. Did I miss him when he came in? You know, the enemy would have been playing all sorts of things in Simeon's heart and mind. Oh, he's not going to turn up. It's a long time waiting. Oh, you've missed him. But Jesus promises that actually if we seek him, we find him. Matthew 7, verses 7 to 8. A really famous scripture. I'm just going to read that out. And it's the ask, seek, and knock. And it should be really encouraging. We could be like Simeon, actually, and um, you know, we have that promise. And Jesus promises if we ask, seek, and knock, he will turn up. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. He who seeks, finds. And to him who knocks, the door will be opened. And that's a really quite important message that Jesus kind of gives to all his disciples. We are called to ask, seek, and uh, knock. How many of us here can hear Jesus knocking in our lives, knocking on our doors, our hearts? Are we going to let him in? Are we going to respond? And that's kind of really the foundation messages that people kind of, we have a moment in time where we do have to open that door. He's knocking. Are we going to open? I keep on coming back over and over to this phrase about, do we feel, do you feel hungry and thirsty? How many people are not satisfied with their relationship with Jesus at the moment? You know, I pray with all my heart that you are not satisfied. I pray the Lord Jesus makes you not satisfied with him at the moment. You might not be happy with that, but it would be great if we were hungry and thirsty. Be hungry and thirsty. Don't be satisfied. Coming to church once a week is not enough. I think it's great coming to church. I think it's great to meet and worship the Lord Jesus and meet with you guys and join in a con congregation that's worshipping Jesus. That is great, but it isn't enough. I think meeting in small, uh, small groups is really helpful. And um, 
you know, in our home group, as we were talking late previously, we, we're kind of trying to put Jesus at the heart of what we do. We worship him, and then we read, well, we, we're going through the Gospels, and um, we are listening to what is Jesus saying, and then how are we going to live it? And then we pray for each other, and we invite Jesus in to our home group. And I think that's what home groups are about. It's inviting, it's like opening the door and saying, come in, Jesus, we want to meet with you. And um, because Sunday morning is just not going to touch the side sometimes. But it's also about seeking Jesus in our quiet space. And I preached this, I can't remember, about two months ago. Um, seeking Jesus in a quiet space, I think, is where it really happens. And those who know me, especially my home group, this is a moment where I can read Song of Songs again. <laughs> <laughs> I only have one message. <laughs> I have one message ever. And um, you know, it is about seeking the Lord. And coming back to that quiet space, Song of Songs 1 verse 4. And I encourage you to go home and do this. You know what it's like? You've probably had a busy day or who knows what's been happening. And... Um, and you're going to crash down on your sofa. And um, this is what I do. You say, oh, thank goodness, <laughs> thank God, I can sit down. And it's just such a great, I encourage you to pray this prayer, this, this scripture. It says, take me away with you. Let us hurry. Let the king bring me into his chamber. You're inviting the Lord Jesus into that space where you are. It doesn't have to be a long time, okay? Don't set your clock. Be as short and long as, as it can be. But just find a space for Jesus to come in and ask him to take you, take you away with him. To be in that kind of personal place where he inhabits, to come and join you in your lounge or bedroom whatever you, you meet him. You know, sometimes we do miss Jesus, and I think he does step back. And um, I, yes, he says, seek and knock. He does say that to us. But sometimes you'll be there, and he's just going to step one or two steps back. And he does that for a reason. So if you're hungry, Jesus is calling you into a closer relationship. Let me just read a bit more of Song of Songs. I just love this bit. This is um, chapter 3, starting at verse 1. So Song of Songs 3, verse 1. All night long... On my bed, I looked for the one my heart loves. I looked for him, but I did not find him. So there's someone here realizes actually where is where is Jesus? The beloved then said, I will get up now and go about the city through its streets and squares. I will search for the one my heart loves. I will search. So this is not being passive. Oh, you know, Jesus is not around. Let's just go, let's put the telly on. Um, or fill whatever gap, whatever you do in those gaps. There's a kind of an intention here. And this is what I think Jesus is calling us as a church. This message just keeps on coming, coming back. And um, I think he probably steps back a little bit so that we can step forward. And so we can say, I will search. I will look for him. And so the beloved, you know, she gets up, she searches the squares and the streets. So I looked for him, but I did not find him. The watchmen found me as they made their rounds in the city. Have you seen the one that my heart loves? So she's asking help. But then the good news on verse 4. Scarcely had I passed. Scarcely had I passed them. When I found the one 
my heart loves. Ask, seek, and knock. I found the one my heart loves. What does she do? This is really important. I held him and would not let him go till I had brought him to my mother's house. So when you find Jesus, and some of you, actually a lot of us, will, will know Jesus at this point, don't let him go. <laughs> Hold on to him. Don't get distracted on all sorts of things that we can get distracted over. Hold on to him. Spend some time on him. Don't let that relationship be neglected. So if you really want, so I'm just going to give you a little thing. If you really want to meet Jesus, how do you do that? I picked this up on a, on a book. I haven't got it with me, but it said, read through the Gospels slowly. And by that, I just meant, if you just sat down like, later on today or sometime in the week, just read a paragraph. You don't have to read the whole chapter. Just take one paragraph and just read it, pray about it, Invite Jesus into it. And effectively, you can ask two questions. What did Jesus say? How am I going to live it? What did Jesus say? How am I going to live it? And I can absolutely promise you, if you do that, you will find Jesus. I think there's absolutely no certainty. Jesus is promising us to seek, to ask, seek, and knock. He's in here, he's in the gospel. You will hear what he says and we can kind of learn how to, to live it. And your life will never be the same again. I'm really rubbish at ending my sermons, okay? I'm actually a teacher, and I'm really rubbish at ending my lessons as well. Um, I, I, can't, I usually get bored. I think I've had enough, oh, let's go. Um, I shouldn't really say that, but... Uh, <laughs> You think I'm joking, actually. <laughs> okay, I didn't, right, where am I going? <laughs> the King of Glory, the Lord God Almighty, this big, big God of ours, came down to meet with every single one of us. And he came into his temple as a baby. He grew into a man. We need to remember that. He grew into a man. And he walked the streets and houses. And he made lots of promises that he would be with us. So yes, don't be intimidated by him in, in the sense that, yes, he's all powerful. But he does. The Song of Songs is very, very adamant about this. That he wants a um, relationship with you and I. Don't neglect that. Hold on to it. And if you haven't got it, get up. Don't be lazy. <laughs> Get up and find him. And he'll turn up and you'll think, thank God for being in my life. Amen. <laughs>